There's a wonderful story about a man who was home with his children one afternoon while his wife went out Christmas shopping. He was reclining on the couch, half sleeping, half watching a Netflix original. When the kids came into the room, Dad, we have a play to put on. Do you want to see it? Well, he really didn't want to, but he knew he needed to. So he sat up, came out of his slumber, and became the one-man audience. His four children, four, six, eight, and ten years old, were the actors. Mary, Joseph, and the visitors from the East. Joseph came in with a mop handle. Mary came in with a pillowcase under her pajamas. The other child was an angel, flapping her arms as wings. Finally, the last child, the eight-year-old, came out. With all of the jewelry she could find in the house, her arms were filled with three presents. I am all three visitors, she said. I bring three precious gifts, gold, circumstance, and mud. Well, these children somehow got to the heart of the Christmas story pretty darn quickly. I love it. Circumstance and mud. Well, the Christmas story is messy. From the Annunciation text we hear today and the perplexing news of the angel Gabriel in Nazareth to the strange narrative we will soon hear about the babe born in Bethlehem. I always see the angel Gabriel not as some pristine, cloaked in white kind of heavenly creature, but one whose wings are a little bent and maybe ripped from all of the travels and tribulations of being a heavenly messenger. You can imagine Gabe got bounced out of a few watering holes in his time when he was trying to bring greetings to God's favored ones. There's no doubt that the message Gabriel brings to Mary is important. It will change the world. Even Mary couldn't believe it. Who, me? Gabriel, are you sure you have the right Mary? What a bold proclamation from Gabriel. What assertive fortitude to claim for God that the Holy Spirit would come and that Mary would bear a child and that that child would be called the Son of God. A pretty outrageous tale, if you ask me. Don't you wish for a birth narrative that made more sense? I mean, have you ever tried sharing the Christmas story with someone who knows nothing about Christmas? Let's say you share the ABCs of Christmas with that person and they are still with you by the time you get to V for virgin, and then you know that you might be on the right path for sharing the appropriate Christian Christmas story. Now, they may have a question or two about this part of the narrative that you might have to go into further detail about. But it's absurd to think that God would choose this plan, this pretty unbelievable scheme. The craziest part of all was the idea that God was born into the world as a human baby. It has always been the claim of the Bible and the church that God was in Jesus in a different way than God is in the rest of us. Incarnation is what the church calls this phenomenon. It's impossible really to explain the incarnation in order to talk about it at all, you have to feel comfortable with the language of mystery. How are you with talking about mystery? It's certainly a problem for me. I, I'm never really comfortable talking in the language of mystery. So when it comes to the issues of Jesus' divine parenthood, I've always been a little fuzzy. Do you believe in the virgin birth? I was once asked by a concerned parishioner. I think so. Yeah, yes, sure, I told him. But then I had a question for him. Now, what exactly did I just get myself into? What exactly is the incarnation? Well, the Bible is not always helpful in answering that question. Sometimes I think the Bible is unnecessarily vague. This is what the angel Gabriel told Mary about the divine conception. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Ooh, that explains everything, doesn't it? 
The Gospel of John explains incarnation this way. And the word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. Well, those are beautiful words, but they leave me with a few more questions than they do answers. Perhaps an ancient doctrine of the church could help clear this up. Well, the Nicene Creed, written in the fourth century, speaks of incarnation in this way, describing Jesus as God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, etc., etc., blah, blah, blah. Again, it's beautiful language cloaked in mystery, draped in poetry, right? I'm sure I would believe those words too if I could understand them. I prefer Luke's version of the birth narrative. Luke's description of the birth of Jesus is all prose, no poetry. He doesn't use many words, but he paints a picture of dirt and sweat and pain, surprise and joy and real people giving birth to a real child. He paints a picture of a young couple far away from home forced to improvise, to make do with what they could find. That God is making do with what God can find. The savior of the world was born in a guest room that doubled as a barn and spent his first night in a water trough. That's what incarnation looks like. It is by definition gritty, grounded and raw and very, very real. Luke's version helps us grasp the immensity of all of this and its absurdity too. In the incarnation, God decided to abandon heaven for earth, trading power and glory for diapers and a teething ring. What kind of God would do something like this? A God who is crazy in love with us. A God who is crazy in love with us. A God who is not afraid to look helpless and weak. Because what is a baby other than helpless and weak? And in the birth of Jesus, God says to us, I am so crazy in love with you that I will come all the way to where you are to be flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. I will do it all because I love you enough to become one of you. God's desire to be near us was so great that God came down from heaven and lived and loved and suffered and rejoiced, did the dishes and washed hands and wore a mask and stayed six feet apart from the person in front and told jokes and knew sorrow and ex experienced suffering and knows what it is to be human. And in Jesus, through Jesus, God understands suffering and pain and death and loss. In Jesus, through Jesus, God understands all of it. Maybe this year more than ever, we need to be reminded that God isn't far away and distant, but that God is close up to us. Boy, don't we need to hear that rich promise again and again. It's Gabriel who proclaimed to Mary that all of this would happen in the circumstance and mud in which she found herself. Mary then would bring the son of God into the world. What an incredible commitment God made and that Mary made too. It certainly was a risk that Mary took by saying yes. What Mary is willing to do is to be the God-bearer. The God-bearer. She accepts this opportunity to bring God into the world. So I wonder what new possibilities lie ahead for us. In our interactions with family and friends, in our work relationships, in those we pass on the streets, or meet in the parking lot on Christmas Day for Bob's, or those who think differently than we do, may we remember that we have a role too in bringing God into the world.
with the rich promises of God being with us in this world, what God is asking of Mary, what God is asking of us, is to keep bringing God into the world. It is five days before Christmas, and my hope and my prayer is that we enter yet again into this oh-so-familiar story. A story of a young mother finding out she would bear God into the world as a baby boy. The story of an earthly father who had the decency to believe his fiance and stay by her side. A story of the Lord of hosts, our savior, born and laid in a manger, whose power is located in vulnerability and selfless love. My hope and prayer is that through that story, we might discover once again the truth about God's incredible commitment to us and to this world that might lead us to watch for the ways that God is still very, very active within humanity and in human history and in our very lives and in this very world. All of that to bring us salvation. Amen.